Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Bird. I'm a New Testament scholar, and in this video, I want to bust up the seven biggest myths about Jesus. I want to break down and take down the strangest, weirdest, and worst misconceptions that people have about Jesus. So stay tuned, and I'm going to let you know the seven things about Jesus that a lot of people get wrong, and I'm going to tell you why it's wrong. Number one. Jesus mythicism. That's the view that Jesus did not exist. Uh, I recently read somewhere, quite disturbingly, that in the United Kingdom, that 20% of young people in Britain think that Jesus did not exist. And that is bad. That is astoundingly you know, bad in, in many ways. Well, let me explain why I think that's wrong. Our earlier sources for the Jesus movement for early Christianity are the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Now, some of them are disputed in authenticity, but if we take the uh, the, the undisputed letters of Paul, we, we could basically say this. The Apostle Paul wrote within 20 to 30 years of Jesus' death. Paul seems to quote from the very words of Jesus when he's talking about uh, divorce and, and things like that. In some places, he recites key events from the life of Jesus, like his final meal with his disciples, the fact that he died. Paul may not have known Jesus himself, but he definitely knew people who knew Jesus. He knew some of Jesus's earliest followers. And it is theoretically possible that when Paul was the zealous Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, maybe he was part of the Jerusalem Pharisaic circle, and maybe he either saw Jesus or at least knew of him during that time. Added to that, we, we can go to Josephus's testimony in Flavianum. Now, the received form of the text obviously has been dressed up by Christian scribes. But if you take out some of the more obvious scribal glosses, uh, I, I think you do have a historical kernel. I think there was a Jesus passage in Josephus. I, I would say probably the vast number of uh, New Testament scholars would probably agree with that. So I think there definitely was a Jesus reference in Josephus. We can also say that the Gospels show the impact of the historical Jesus on his earliest followers and, and the very genesis of the Jesus movement. Uh, now, the Gospels are not history in the sense of what it was like to walk around Jesus filming him with your iPhone or something like that. I, I do believe there is a lot of history in the Gospels, but at the same time, it's not mere history. It's also being narrated in light of the church's faith in Jesus. So what we find in the Gospels are a mixture of faith and fact, history and hermeneutic, authenticity and artistry. But at the same time, it's not fiction being created from nothing. They are telling the real story of a historical person in a particular location. It's, it's not myth. There is a real historical man at the core of all this. Another thing worth noting is that there's a, a number of ex-Christian scholars who aren't necessarily friendly to historical or you know, evangelical or Catholic Christianity, people like Morris Casey and Bart Ehrman, despite their skepticism, a bit of celebrity skepticism in the case of uh, Bart Ehrman, they both believe that Jesus existed and they tend to get quite irate with people who say that they uh, that Jesus did not exist. So even some of the leading skeptical scholars, you know, Morris Casey now passed away and currently Bart M, and even they acknowledge that Jesus existed. And for me, the other, the other thing I want to stress here, if there was no historical Jesus, then you have the big problem of trying to explain why did the early church begin and why did it take on the shape and characteristics that it did if there was no historical Jesus. The alternative theories are conspiratorial, speculative, and on the whole, very unconvincing. The view that Jesus did not exist is effectively QAnon for atheists. Now to any atheist watching, I want you to know, even if Jesus existed, you can still be an atheist. I mean, there's other reasons for being an atheist that have nothing to do with the historical Jesus. You don't have to tether yourself to this sort of YouTube-y conspiratorial theory of skepticism. Uh, 
that kind of likes to think about itself as being intellectual and that kind of thing, but it's, it's really pseudo pseudo intellectual stuff. So yeah, I think Jesus really did exist. Uh, I, I did do a video on this explicit topic over at the Nazareth Nicaea playlist. You can check that out, but I'd also recommend to you a recent podcast I listened to by Helen Bond over at the Ancients podcast where she talked about Jesus of Nazareth. So that's the first myth we've bust up. Jesus definitely existed. Second myth that I want to bust up, and this one's a bit more controversial. Uh, did Jesus claim to be divine? Did he claim to be God? Uh, well, uh, there's a lot we can say about this topic. I, let me clear the deck. Let me clear the deck and say this. I don't think Jesus walked around Galilee and Judea saying, you know, hi, I'm God. I'm going to die for your sins very soon. But first, let me tell you some cute moral stories that will one day receive their definitive form when taught by talking vegetables. Uh, I don't think that's what Jesus was doing. OK, um, even if you discount the Gospel of John, where you get a lot of the high Christology, a lot of the more explicit statements of divinity of attributed to Jesus, even if you discount that and focus just on the synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark and Luke, you you, you do get the impression almost everywhere and very quickly that Jesus claimed a special authority in the kingdom of God. He claimed that he possessed an unmediated sense of divine authority. He had the authority to forgive sins, which he exercised in some of his healings, which some of his scribal critics regard as an affront to monotheism. I mean, who can forgive sins but, but God alone? Uh, when Jesus is entering Jerusalem, he kind of grieves and laments for the city because uh, the inhabitants, the leadership there did not recognize the time of their visitation from God. I mean, that's, that's a key text. So he identifies his own coming to Jerusalem with the, the I think, the coming of Yahweh as king, as, as deliverer of the people. Uh, at his trial, at his trial, uh, when Jesus is asked by the high priest Caiaphas if he is the son of the Blessed One, the Messiah, Jesus responds by saying, you know, I am. But then he brings together a couple of texts, Psalm 110, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Daniel 7, 13 to 14, about the Son of Man who comes before the Ancient of Days. He blends those two texts together in his answer. Now, that's significant because both texts refer to a figure being co-enthroned with, with Yahweh, okay, to be a throne sharer with the God of Israel, which means Jesus was claiming that he would participate, or he did participate, in the orbit of divine sovereignty, which is why Caiaphas then, you know, tears his robes and says, this is, this is, this is blasphemy. Okay, so th these are uh, incredibly elevated claims to divine prerogatives. Uh, and I always go back to a, a quote from, from Dale Allison on this. I like what Dale Allison said. He said, all the primary sources repeatedly purport that Jesus had astounding things to say about himself. One can disassociate him from an exalted self-conception only through multiple radical surgeries of our texts. And Allison adds, we should hold a funeral for the view that Jesus entertained no exalted thoughts about himself. Now, I've written about this uh, a lot more in the book, How God Became Jesus, which is a response to Bart Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God, also in the New Testament world, and I've got a video on this. Uh, for me, look, it, it all comes down to what are the implicit claims of the historical Jesus. At the one hand, Jesus was a good monotheist. He prays to God. He he, you know, proclaims the kingdom of God, but he, he also believes he has an elevated place in the divine plan for which the language of being a Messiah and a divine son is the most appropriate. So, yeah, I, I think I think it's definitely the case that Jesus made claims, sometimes in, implicitly, sometimes quite explicit, that he has divine prerogatives and he is a divine person. So. I think that myth is somewhat busted. The idea Jesus is just a mere prophet, I don't think that stands by the evidence. Okay, myth number three, or mistake number three. The Son of Man is human, 
and the Son of God is divine. Uh, you know, people often think, you know, Son of Man refers to Jesus' as humanity, and Son of God refers to his divinity, and that is kind of true. I mean, this is the problem. It, it is kind of true. So, Jesus is the Son of Man. This could be like Psalm 8, you know, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the Son of Man that you should care for him? So, Son of Man can be somewhat idiomatic for the Hebrew, you know, Ben Adam, you know, a son of a man or a son of Adam. So, it does speak to his humanity. And also in, in, in John's gospel, you know, in the prologue, Jesus is called the, the son of God, you know, the, the, the one who is the only begotten of God, which speaks to his divine sonship, perhaps even in a quasi ontological sense that he's, he's the son of God and therefore the genus or the species of God. I mean, you can definitely take it that way. The problem is both of these titles, son of man and son of God, they can kind of also refer to the opposite. Uh, you, you can see a divine man and a human son, the way these titles get used. So, so let me tell you what I'm talking about. If you go to Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14, you have this mysterious figure, the, the one like a son of man, okay, who represents, I think, uh, God's people, God's kingship and God's king. This, this mysterious human figure comes before the Ancient of Days and then receives, you know, power, glory, and dominion. Basically is made a participant in divine sovereignty. And this is all given to a human figure. Uh, that means he is in some sense, you know, perhaps heavenly, in some sense divine. And that, that Daniel text from, from, from chapter 7 is then used for mysterious heavenly divine son of man figures I think in the Gospels, in the book of Revelation, but also in, in other Jewish literature, such as the parables of Enoch, that's, that's in 1 Enoch, and in 4 Ezra. So Son of Man can also be a kind of divine title. And the same goes for Son of God. It's not just and only or exclusively a divine title. If you go to Psalm 2, you know, Israel's king can be called the Son, you know, when he's enthroned or installed as king. You've got those words from Psalm 2 verse 7, uh, you are my king, uh, so you are my son today, I have begotten thee. Similar language of Israel's king as a son of David and a son of God in Psalm 89. And this really goes back to the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So yeah, um, son of God and son of man can be titles for a human figure or a divine figure based on which parts of the Old Testament you're kind of interpreting it through. So yeah, there's a there's a little bit of a little bit of a paradox or a little bit of ambiguity in some of the key Christological titles in the New Testament. Myth number four. Uh, another wrong assumption is that Jesus proclaimed the kingdom and then the church proclaimed Jesus. Uh, this is a view that comes up every now and again when people want to stress the discontinuity between Jesus and the early church. So Jesus was talking about, you know, the kingdom of God, the love of God and the brotherhood of man. And then Paul and all his friends were into a high Christology that Jesus is, is God. And they've got some medieval focus on his death as a, as a gory way of making expiation and sacrifice for people's sins. But it had nothing to do with what Jesus was on about. And I mean, on the one hand, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 8, and if you compare that to a, a passage like Romans 3, 21 to 26, where Paul talks about how the righteousness of God is revealed in Jesus's death, I mean, they're not talking about the same stuff, as it were. I mean, there's, there, there is some, you know, big differences there. But I don't think you can drive an absolute wedge between Jesus and the early church. Because when Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God, there was always an implicit self-reference in it. You know, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom, but as one who was its arbiter, chief agent, and king. And that's why you get stuff like this said in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus said, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or, as he tells the disciples, I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom. 
so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus is not merely the one who announces the kingdom. He is, in a sense, the king of the coming kingdom. And he did explicitly emphasize his role in the, the future judgment, the future salvation, the future restoration of Israel, if you like. The other thing we've got to say here is that even when the church proclaimed Jesus, it wasn't just on his divinity and his atonement. There was a deliberate attempt to show the continuity between what Jesus was doing and the, the message, the preaching and the praxis of the early church. And that's why in Luke's account of the early church, he shows that the, the preaching of Jesus, the preaching of the name of Jesus and the kingdom of God are frequently found together. You know, uh, Luke talks about how Philip, the evangelist, Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Paul, when he was in Rome, we're told he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance. In fact, I would say if you look across the entire narrative of Luke and Acts, you see how the, the preaching of the kingdom, performing healings, exorcisms and miracles, uh, that is something expressed in both Jesus, Peter, and Paul. So there's a unity of preaching and praxis between Jesus and his apostles. So I don't think we can say that the, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom and then the church kind of got drunk on their own Christological reflections on Jesus and a medieval atonement theology. I don't think that's happening at all. Number five, Mark has a low Christology. I've got to be honest, this is a bit of a this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. This really, really irks me. Uh, even many scholars seem to think, look, you know, the Gospel of John has high Christology. You know, it's, it's clearly high Christology. Just as the word made flesh. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. Thomas says, you know, my Lord and my God. So John is high Christology. The Gospel of Mark is not John. Therefore, Mark is low Christology. Now, from the outset, I've got to say, I think this, the very categories of what counts as high and low seem to be a little bit arbitrary, okay? Or they're kind of setting up a particular criteria for what makes something high Christology, and that means you've got to sound exactly like the Gospel of John. But I would say you could have an intensely divine Jesus without being divine in the way described, implied, or narrated by the evangelist John. I think you can have a intensely divine Jesus without having to use Johannine idioms, categories, or, or intertext for the way he's describing that. So I don't like the, the high-low breakdown. I think we need another taxonomy for describing the diversity of, of Christologies in the New Testament. But let me, let me say this about the Gospel of Mark. This is what I find perplexing, and maybe you find it perplexing too. I don't know. The Gospel of Mark opens with Jesus as as you know the Son of God in the you know in the in in, in the uh, in, in Kippet. I mean, depending on some textual variant. So he's identified as you know, at least the Messiah, maybe the Son of God. Uh, then John the Baptist declares, you know, the way of the Lord. You know, the, the the coming of Yahweh to redeem and rescue His people. That is straight out of Isaiah forty verse three. So that's. That's John's prophetic paradigm. He is preparing the way of the Lord from Isaiah, and the guy who steps onto the scene next is Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, Jesus equals Yahweh, but it means the coming of Yahweh as king, as deliverer for this new exodus, for the end of exile. All of that is telescoped into the person of Jesus. Uh, I mean, so that's how the gospel opens. And then you've got the, you know, chapter two, you've got the, the scene where Jesus has the authority to forgive sins, which is potentially an affront to monotheism. You've got the various nature miracles, which, you know, depending on which parts of the Old Testament you think he's, uh, the evangelist is alluding to, that could show that Jesus has the power over nature, very similar to what Yahweh has and, you know, treading the waters and the oceans and the waves. 
And then at the very end of the gospel, a Roman centurion calls him the son of God, and that's after his trial before Caiaphas, where he basically says he's going to be co-enthroned with Yahweh. Okay, so I think these are these are amazing claims that are, are made about Jesus. Uh, I have a good chapter on this in my book, Jesus the Eternal Son, where I try to show that Mark's Christology is 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 really up there uh, with the Gospel of John. And and in fact, let let me leave you with one of my favorite quotes about Mark and Christology, uh, one from uh, the American scholar uh, Eugene Boring. I mean, this this is what he says. I th I think this is a great quote. He says. The explicit use of God language for Jesus by later New Testament authors and classical creeds is in continuity with the Christology already present in Mark. To state the matter somewhat provocatively, John, Nicaea, and Chalcedon understood and developed Mark's Christology in a more profound sense than was done by either Matthew or Luke. Chalcedon may perhaps be understood as more Markan than, than Johannine, since John has more explicit subordinationist tendencies than does Mark. Disputed, but we'll accept it. Uh, Christians who are concerned with both canon and creed need not, therefore, attempt to get Mark to be Nicene or Johannine, but should attempt to understand Mark in his own terms. Uh, I think that is correct. I think Mark does have an a, uh, intensely divine Jesus, and just because he's doing it in a different way to John's gospel doesn't mean he's any less divine. Number six, the gospels are simply ripping off myths of dying and rising gods. Okay, um, one of the favorite tricks or devices of the YouTube mythicists, uh, and it's very wrong, is the idea that Jesus is just Horus or Osiris or Dionysus rubbed up in a different garb. And to that I say, oh, sweet mother of Melchizedek, uh, it is bad, it is, it is nauseating. So look, you know, Paul does talk about, you know, Christ dying and rising and how we can die and rise with Christ. And that's why you get all these uh, comparisons with other deities that die and somehow they come back to life. Uh, and, you, and you get snorri, stories, snippets, rituals, and myths about like the Egyptian deity Osiris or the Phoenician deity Adonis. Uh, but let's take the example of, of, of Adonis, okay? Our knowledge of Adonis comes from a 5th century author, Paniasis, and Lucian of Samosata in the 2nd century you know, AD. Now, in the account given by uh, Paniasis, uh, you know, Adonis is the subject of a custody battle between two goddesses, Persephone and Aphrodite. Uh, Zeus intervenes and awards Adonis to Persephone for one third of the year. And Persephone was the wife of Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, which is why Adonis spends one third of the year in the underworld. So he's a kind of a god who kind of, you know, moves between the the place of the gods and from the underworld. So it's kind of like a, you know, he has a resurrection sort of once a year. Uh, according to Lucian, though, Adonis was a young hunter killed by a wild boar, and there is a memorial of his suffering each year where they beat their breasts, mourn, and celebrate the rites. They first sacrifice to Adonis as if to a dead person, but then on the next day they proclaim that he lives and they send him into the air. So yeah, that, that's that's uh, the sort of image that Adonis has a, a a deity. Every year he kind of dies and comes back to life. But note in the uh, in the later, sorry, not later, the earlier account of uh, Adonis, he's not a dying and rising god. While in the later account from Lucian, uh, I think postdates Christianity in this. You know, maybe even influenced by um, Christianity. Uh, one one scholar, uh, Tregeve Mettinger, I hope I pronounced that correctly, says this. He says, we must realize that the Adonis cults were exposed to strong competition from the Christian church. Could the notion of the resurrection of, of Adonis perhaps be a feature confiscated from Christianity? To ask that question is to ask whether or not we have reasons to think that Adonis was a dying and rising God already in pre-Christian times. So look, any element of comparative Christology, comparing Jesus to 
other ancient figures is always going to find something that might be a little bit similar or a little bit different. But these uh, so-called dying and rising gods, particularly the accounts that are from the 2nd, 3rd and 4th century, there's a very good chance that it's not Christianity borrowing from them. In fact, they're the ones who are borrowing from Christianity. So, yeah, um, often the, the death and resurrection of these gods are part of the cycles of nature. Uh, they're not necessarily referring to a historical figure at all. So I don't think that Jesus' story is a ripoff from ancient accounts of dying and rising gods in paganism. Seventh and finally, the myth that Constantine had Jesus declared a god. Uh, this is just so Dan Brown that it's so wrong, uh, and yet it's it's a very it's a very common misconception. I've I've spoke to people on the bus who have believed stuff like this. So thank you, Dan Brown. Now. I can tell you this, pretty much from the moment of Jesus' resurrection, or at least you know, belief in his resurrection, everybody thought Jesus was divine in some sense. The question was not whether he was divine, but in what sense was he divine? Was he like a human being who had been uh, adopted as God's son, or had he been deified when he was taken into heaven? Uh, was Jesus an angel who became human? Was it simply a, a, a mode of God the Father's self-revelation? Was he a second God? I mean, the church wrestled with a lot of different ways of thinking of Jesus as divine, and, and gradually, through a bit of trial and error and you know, reading the New Testament, reading the Old Testament, using a bit of philosophical language, they, they were trying to refine what it meant to say Jesus was divine, and was he divine in the same sense as the Father? Uh, again, this is this is explicitly what I try to get my head around and explain to people in my book, Jesus Among the Gods, where I argue the debate was not, is Jesus divine, but in what sense was Jesus divine? So Jesus was definitely not declared a God by Constantine at the Council of Nicaea, in 313 AD. That's not what happened. And in fact, you, you can go through a bunch of authors, I think in the late 1st and 2nd century, uh, where Jesus is clearly called divine. I think, you know, in, in, in the Didache, uh, Jesus is called the, not the son of David, but the God of David. Uh, you know, Bishop Melito of Sardis in the 2nd century says, for he was born a son and led as a lamb and slaughtered as a sheep and buried as a man and rose from the dead as God, being God by nature and a man. You know, we, we could go through all sorts of church fathers, you know, from Irenaeus to Ignatius of Antioch and everywhere, but they all kind of show that Jesus is divine. But the question is, in what sense was Jesus divine? That's what we've got to wrestle with. And that's what the church was trying to specify in their various debates about who is Jesus in relation to God the Father. So there we are. Those are the seven myths and misconceptions about Jesus, popular amongst internet skeptics, but also sometimes amongst Christians today as well. If there's any myths or mistakes you think I've missed, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts about anything I, I missed or anything maybe you think I messed up in my telling of the story. Uh, if you like this episode, check out other episodes on the channel, different playlists I've got like Nazareth and Nicaea, things on political theology, on early Christianity. Check them out and maybe you'll like them. Uh, and if you really do, yeah, hit the subscribe button and uh, keep up with what I'm doing. I try to do some regular videos every month and explain things about the early church, early Christianity, some of the difficult parts of the New Testament, and debates in theology, both ancient and in the world today. So thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you around the channel.